Tonight, on a special edition of 2020, Joan Rivers, living for the laughs. You'd watch. I'd watch. <laughs> Wouldn't you? I'd I'll watch. probably watch. The passing of a superstar who turned making fun into making us laugh. No target off limits, especially herself. My husband said, let me help you with the buttons, and I said, I said I'm naked. <laughs> From red carpet dresses. As a dress, I hate it. As something to wash the bird <laughs> off my car. <laughs> to trash talking takedowns. From reinventing herself through years of plastic surgery. To cracking up Barbara Walters through years of friendship. Every time I cross my legs, my mouth snaps open. <laughs> Tonight, new details from inside the hospital from one of her closest friends. I was given the privilege of getting to say goodbye. Her triumphs and tragedies. And what she told David Muir about Johnny Carson. Hung up on me. Never, never spoke to me again. How she overcame them all with humor and heart. Letting the cameras in on her life with daughter Melissa. I've had an amazing life. If it ended right now, Amazing. Joan Rivers, living for the laughs. Here's David Muir. Good evening. Tonight here, saying goodbye to a comedic legend, Joan Rivers. Fans across this country and the world still sending their messages of support. Her daughter, Melissa, by her side right up until the end. Tonight here, what we found, Joan Rivers in her own words on what she hoped would happen when she died. Also this evening, the pain behind her humor, her husband taking his life, that last phone call with Johnny Carson. And tonight, the investigation into what happened during what was supposed to be a routine procedure as we look back on Joan Rivers living for the laughs. Tonight, the flowers on the doorstep of the apartment building where Joan Rivers lived here in New York. In Los Angeles, on her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, America remembering a legendary comedian now gone. It was just last week, the 81-year-old had a packed schedule, doling out some of that classic celebrity ribbing on her e-show, Fashion Police. It looks like it's gonna split at any minute, like, like Beyonce and Jay-Z, I'm scared. Then performing for a nighttime crowd at a New York theater. It was the very next day Rivers was undergoing a routine procedure on her vocal cords at a medical clinic when something went horribly wrong. She went into cardiac arrest, Authorities rushing her to New York's Mount Sinai Hospital. How is your mother? Her daughter Melissa, her only child, racing from Los Angeles to be by her mother's side. We're all praying for your mother, Melissa. Prayers coming in for Joan Rivers from all over the world. But after a week in the hospital in a medically induced coma, Rivers was taken off life support. Inside Edition's Deborah Norville, a close friend of nearly 25 years, was right there at the hospital. At a certain point, it was clear that the Joan that we loved was not a Joan that we would get to be with again. And um, I was given the privilege of getting to say goodbye. Like so many who were closest to Joan Rivers, Norville has unanswered questions about what happened during what was supposed to be a routine visit to the doctor. This wasn't even fixing anything. This was to just look in there and see why our boys had gotten raspy. Should have happened. Shouldn't have happened. The New York State Health Department has now opened an investigation into the clinic where Rivers was having that procedure. Tonight, a source telling ABC News right now there is no suspicion of wrongdoing. I personally am really grateful to the Health Department of New York for launching an investigation and asking these questions so that there will be answers and so that Joan's family is not in the position of having to wonder or having to drive the process. And tonight, that clinic saying they can't talk about the case because of privacy laws, offering this statement that the clinic would proactively cooperate with any governmental review. Within moments of that headline that Joan Rivers was gone, a tidal wave of kind words, tweets pouring in from heartbroken fans and the comedians who came after Joan, including Ellen DeGeneres who said, Joan Rivers will always be a pioneer. She paved the way for a lot of comedians. I'm very sad she's gone. Tonight here, we focus on her life, one filled with pioneering triumph and personal tragedy, all of it fueling her humor. My wedding night, she said, bring along something black and sexy. I took Diana Ross. I, I know nothing. It was just a few years ago we went to find her, down those stairs at a New York comedy club. Hey, Joan. Yes, yes, sir. Are we bugging you? 
a career that began nearly 50 years ago when she burst onto the Ed Sullivan Show. Here is Little Joan Rivers. Weren't you pregnant on Ed Sullivan? Pregnant and you weren't allowed to say it. Soon we're going to hear the pitter-patter of little feet. And that was breaking ground. That was breaking ground to say pitter-patter of little feet. May I say, Mr. Sullivan, I'm delighted to be here. Hers was a trailblazing journey. On that day, she was also being chronicled by a documentary crew. And there was Joan, joking about her own mortality. They're praying they don't die during this, this filming. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be amazing? They got the last year of Joan Rivers. They would give them such a hook. People would watch. People would watch. That's sick. We were there. I know, but, wouldn't, but still, sick, but very commercial. You'd watch. I'd watch. <laughs> If only she knew the attention, the outpouring of love she would one day receive. And just listen to what she told me backstage. Greta, how big you get, honey? Don't forget you always walk through the kitchen. We followed her up those stairs for a show. Behind the door, a packed crowd, half her age. Joan's humor never got old. This is where my career has come to. This. All my other. Friends are getting Kennedy honors. I'm sitting on a stool that's coming apart. Okay. She also invited us into her sprawling New York City apartment. Photographs, memories everywhere. She took me back to her first days on The Tonight Show, her first big break. A man doesn't want to come home after a hard day at the office and find some wild-looking, sexy white line on a carpet saying, Hiya, tiger. <laughs> yes, he does. He does. <laughs> right smack then and there. Changed my life. Weren't you the first and only permanent host? I was the first permanent guest host, man, woman, a child, yeah. And only. And that gig with Johnny Carson would one day lead to an offer to do her own late night show on another network. And as soon as I got the Fox show, I called Johnny and said, Johnny, I've got it. And he hung up, hung up on me. Never, never spoke to me again. Her show lasted just seven months. It was over. And so was her friendship with Carson. And as Joan struggled publicly, her husband was struggling privately. He killed himself in 1987. For years, she would use humor to mask the pain of losing him. My husband left me all the money and the condition. I had to visit him every single day. So I had him cremated and sprinkled in Neiman Marcus. And now sometimes I visit him twice a day. <laughs> you never saw him so much. I never saw him so much. I, weekends, holidays, I'm banging on the door. Humor because of great pain and great anger is really where it comes from. And with my husband, I had both barrels. I'm still furious with him. Son of a They say to me, oh, you'll go to heaven, you'll meet Edgar. I'll kill him. After the death of her husband, Joan, a single mother, was completely alone. Hello? And then a call came. A daytime talk show was in the works, and other stars had turned it down. She would soon turn her enormous pain into enormous success, the first of many professional reinventions that Joan would undergo. That year, she was at the Emmys, up against Oprah and Donahue. And the winner is, I'm shaking, Joan Rivers. <laughs> Two years ago, I couldn't get a job in this business. I could not get a job. It's so sad that he's not here because it was my husband, Edgar Rosenberg, who always said, you can turn things around. A decade later, she was back again, being discovered by a new generation of fans, this time on the red carpet with her daughter, asking and saying anything. Can we see the ring? Sure. Oh, you are a fool. <laughs> it should be four times this size. <laughs> you should be ashamed of yourself. I know. People have such enormous respect for you, and they have watched you kind of reinvent yourself along the way. Over and over and over. <laughs> and there's enormous respect. I think because we're in a business uh, where we don't know where our next job is coming from. You have to constantly reinvent. Also, I'm very shallow, and I'm a true whore. I like to try everything. She talked openly about her many plastic surgeries in the OR long before many, and she told me how she explained it in the beginning. Her daughter, still a baby. Of course, my eyes were black and blue. So I was carrying Melissa, and no one did their eyes in those days. So people would say to me, what happened to you? And I'd say, the baby punched me in the eyes. <laughs> and they bought it. People were so stupid in those days. Poor Melissa. Poor Melissa. Kids gone. <laughs> Kid hit me in the eyes. <laughs> and as we would all learn, behind all of that humor, her humility. I'm proud of nothing, my darling. I am swimming upstream. 
I think the key to life is if you don't laugh at yourself, you're an ass. You're a fool. And anyone that doesn't laugh at themselves, they are so out of my book. And tonight, her daughter Melissa reminding the world of that same message, offering this statement. My mother's greatest joy in life was to make people laugh. Although that is difficult to do right now, I know her final wish would be that we return to laughing soon. And as we would discover in her memoirs, Rivers herself knew exactly what she wanted when she died. I want my funeral to be, to be a huge showbiz affair with lights and cameras and action. I want craft services, I want paparazzi, I want publicists making a scene. I want it to be Hollywood all the way. Don't give me some rabbi rambling on. I want Meryl Streep crying in five different accents. I want to look gorgeous, better dead than I do alive. I want to be buried in a Valentino gown. I want Harry Winston to make me a toe tag. Dang, she would love every bit of this publicity. Joan was the first 15 minutes on all the morning programs today. Joan would love this. When we come back, Barbara Walters and Joan Rivers, 25 years of friendship and truth telling about the career that almost didn't happen. I was fired from the job every night. I only would come back and say, you're gone. Next on 2020. Enjoy your bodies now. Oh, out of Brazil, this is how I go to the bathroom. I mean, it is just... I use my left boob now as a stopper in the tub. I mean, you've got... Yes. Still making us laugh, the humor of Joan Rivers. And as you know, I learned myself here, interviewing Joan Rivers was always unpredictable. She was a dear friend to ABC News, sitting down with honesty, humility, and such candor through the years. But as Barbara Walters often learned over 25 years of friendship, you still did not know what was coming. It seems to me that everybody out here has a name for their house. You yes. have a name for your house? Mortgage Manor. <laughs> when I interviewed her back in 1982, Joan Rivers was flying high. She was one of the hottest nightclub acts in America, on the road almost 10 months a year, earning up to $100,000 a week. She was the brash blonde who lived larger and louder than life. Can we talk here? You want to know what bravery is? Bravery is to make a gynecologist appointment and to show up. That is what bravery is all about. Nothing embarrasses you. On a stage. Nothing. Yeah. In private life, everything. You're very different off stage than yeah. on. What's the difference? Uh, on stage, I say all the things I think about in the shower. You know, it's like you go to a party and the next day you say, I should have said that to that one. I should. And then the nice thing is you go on stage and you say it. Because I'm very shy and I'm very pulled back. I hate to meet new people. And I'm very intimidated by the greats. Did you become a comedian because it's your way perhaps of saying, you're not going to make fun of me. You're not going to tear me down. I'm going to do it before you. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you tell them first, then they can't get you. They can't get, they can't get to hurt you. Born Joan Molinsky, she grew up in Larchmont, New York. Ah! Oh, the ugliest child ever born in Larchmont, New York, okay? Doctor looked at me and slapped my mother. You want to hear stories? Then he pushed me back in and screamed, she's not done yet. How did a nice Jewish girl, daughter of a doctor, become a comedian? Um, I went to, we all went to be actresses. How did your parents feel when you said, I want to be in show business? <laughs> Terrible scene. And if I had come to them and said, I want to be a doctor, they said, go, do it. If I had said, I want to be a rocket scientist, they would have said, isn't that nice? I said, I want to be an actress. And my father, whenever a prostitute came to his office, they would say, I'm an actress. You know what I mean? So when I said, I'm an actress, I want to be an actress, my father said, she wants to be a prostitute. So they threw me out. They just couldn't take it. They tossed me out of the house. A Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Barnard College, Joan started her career calling herself Pepper January comedy with spice. I was singing in strip joints, I'm in love with Mr. Clean. I was doing singing, you know, and they would just go crazy, you know, take it off. And then if I had, it would have been worse. <laughs> Those early years were lean and hungry days. No stage was too humble for a woman who was cracking the glass ceiling of an all white male comedy club. What was it like? Oh, the Barbara, the worst. It was awful, it was horrendous. And I was fired from the job every night. I would, I would do these shows, one show, and the, the owner would come back and say, you're gone. 
Were you that bad? I was performing, and over the loudspeaker, the owner said, get her out of here. It was <laughs> awful. And to that, because of that, I was fired so often that to this, not to this day, up to about three years ago, I would leave nothing in a dressing room. I was so superstitious. Because the, the worst part is to come back the next day when you've been fired and have to pick up all your makeup and explain to all the cleaning people. We now know those years of trawling the seedy nightclub circuit finally paid off. February 17th. I think it meant yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I knew it was just a moment did you walk out on the stage. And I had been uh, kicking around in the business for six years before that and told three weeks before my agent, you're too old and you're not funny. And I went on the Carson show as a girl writer. I had been brought to the Carson show seven times. I had auditioned for them, seven times. And got turned down. Seven times turned down. And I was in the village and starving and it was, it was a horrendous period for me, terribly down, terribly depressed. And I went on the Carson show and that night, <laughs> I get very emotional, he said, um, you're gonna be a star. Look at this, I thought the car I can't even talk about. It. And that changed my life. I'm so grateful to him, I tell him, all these years later, I still thank him. He changed my whole life. He turned around and said, you're all wrong. She is funny. What did you I do said, that night? I couldn't believe it. See, I'm crying now. I couldn't believe it. I looked, he said, you're going to be a star. And I looked next to me. Who was he talking to? And my agent said, from now on, he said, I guarantee you'll make at least $150 a week for the rest of your life. Wow. Wow. And I said, but I said that time, wow. Because <laughs> I was getting $6 a night at that point. I interviewed Joan before that bitter break with Johnny Carson. Here's Joan River! Those were the golden years when she had become his most popular stand-in. You do the Johnny Carson show probably more than any other guest host, do you not? I do it a lot. You do it, okay. Yet, when there are times when, when you hear that Johnny may or may not leave the show and names come up as possible replacements, I don't hear your name. Never. Why? I'm a woman. I'm acerbic, I'm New York, and I'm Jewish. It's okay to guest host, but you couldn't do it all the time? No, no way. No Would way. you want to? In a second, <laughs> but it'll never happen. I can see why being a woman would do it, yeah. you know. Why New York and Jewish? Again, because there's a certain roughness, there's a certain edge to a New Yorker. And anybody that has a little zap to them turns a lot of people off. And you want to go, I'm just here to make you laugh. Yeah. It's all a joke, folks, you know. Yeah. You have worked very hard. You've described yourself sometimes as a turtle. Yeah. Very, my career is very slow. People don't think so. Oh, Barbara, it's little tiny steps. My career is not a, that you go on a show and you take off. Um, it's been from the beginning inching up, inching up, inching, inch, and it's still that way. For more years than I can remember, Joan and I shared laughter and friendship both off stage and on. Her Majesty, Joan Rivers. <laughs> and no more Botox. No more Botox. Oh, wow. Betty White's bowels move more than my face. I mean, that's <laughs> it. It's like, <laughs> Joan. There's enough here to be a skin down. She often joked with me about being the queen of plastic surgery. Just look at how radically her face changed through the years. What we all love about you is that you do make fun of yourself. What are some of the things you say oh. about Joan Rivers? Uh, with facelifts, uh, yeah. every time I cross my legs, my mouth snaps open. <laughs> um, I really am thrilled I got my face tightened because now every time that I swallow, I have an orgasm. I mean, I have a million <laughs> jokes. But, you know, it, by laughing at it, it makes it okay. Why are you so open? You didn't have to be. Because... We're in a society where looks count, Barbara. That's number one. And all the beautiful women lie and say, I've done nothing. And that is so unfair. And I just wanted women to know, it's okay, do it. What do you say to people who say, Joan Rivers, you have just done too much? And I say, mind your business. And if it's a man, I always look at the wife, who's usually 11 years old with fake breasts. <laughs> The woman America knew as a pop culture icon, comedian, talk show host, author, actress, red carpet gadfly, was my brave and fearless friend. Even at 81, she was still the hardest working woman in show business that I know.
I work very hard for where I am, but I'm also very, very lucky and I'm very, very grateful. Every night before I walk on stage, I always say, thank you, God, just in case he's listening. When we come back, Joan Rivers on figuring out the chemistry of comedy and how she passed on its DNA to the next generation. And I can still take you, sweetheart, with both hands tied behind my back. Next on Joan Rivers, Living for the Laughs. Joan Rivers, a comedy legend, continues. Here now, Chris Connolly. She would not go gentle into any good night. Joan, look this way, sweetie. Some of her later years saw Joan Rivers trying to pick public fights, as she did on David Letterman's Late Show with the singer Adele. Oh, yeah, a lovely woman. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, no, no, she's thin. Uh, can we just talk to each other here? Yet this past July, she would walk off a CNN set when interviewer Frederica Whitfield characterized Rivers' critiques as mean. You sell out on stage, uh, even with your fashion critiquing. While it's very mean in some ways, people it's can't not wait mean. to it's hear not what you mean. Have to say. Really? It's not, it's not mean. mean. Stop it with, and you do this, and you're mean, and you're that. You are not the one to interview a person who does humor. Sorry. Are we serious? Joan Rivers was serious about her professional prerogatives. For her, being a comic gave her the right to ridicule, like her friend Don Rickles. And just as Bob Hope did before her, Rivers kept a career's worth of gags readily accessible on 3x5 index cards, filed by topic in her home office, as the 2010 documentary Joan Rivers, A Piece of Work, revealed. Joan was always writing notes, always keeping little scraps of paper in her purse with her jokes, and then it would go into the file cabinet. Why should a woman cook so her husband can say, my wife makes a delicious cake to some hooker? <laughs> and you wonder why I'm still working at this age. Through more than 50 years of stand-up, Rivers was a kind of alchemist who began by spinning threads from her own life into comic gold as she did on The Carol Burnett Show. I'm from Brooklyn, but I haven't been back there for a long time. When I left, I left as a little ugly, flat-chested little girl, and here I am, voila, today. <laughs> An ugly, flat-chested little woman. But, uh... In 1967, on one of her career-establishing appearances on The Ed Sullivan Show, a 31-year-old Joan came off anything but aggressive, looking shiny as a penny and sounding like she wouldn't hurt a flea. A girl, you're 30 years old, you're not married, you're an old maid. A man, he's 90 years old, he's not married, he's a catch. It's a whole different thing. At her peak in 1986, on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, a revved up Joan was out on the edge. Oh, grow up! Just starting to take down the famous. Christy Brinkley's a living testament. She's what? <laughs> you never can look at me and do these, can you? <laughs> She's Tell me about her a little bit. <laughs> She's a living testament. Living testament to that. that what? Lucy Brinkley is a living testament that <laughs> peroxide causes brain damage. <laughs> While she gleefully pushed the pre-cable envelope on relationships with unsentimental smarts and the candor of a cab driver. Don't you think men really like intelligence more when it comes right down to it? Ah, please. No man person. has ever put his hand up a woman's dress looking for a library card. By the 21st century, she was suns out, guns out on the red carpet, teeing off on award show celebrities with their fashion foibles. It's the first time I've ever seen a woman with a case of blue balls. I mean, it's just like... Ah! <laughs> um, ouch? Yet for Rivers, it wasn't about being mean. It was about being funny. She really believed that by insulting someone or taking them to task, she was actually doing them a favor. She actually believed that it was a kind of great compliment, that it meant they were relevant. She did not see her insults as being terribly insulting. Her unabashed willingness to go there would empower everyone from Kathy Griffin to Wanda Sykes. I tried waxing for the first time, yeah. I 
smack the shit out of her. Her fearlessness, shining in the work of such super smart comic superstars as Tina Fey, like Rivers, a Second City alum, and Amy Poehler, here at the 2013 Golden Globes. I um, haven't really been following the controversy over Zero Dark Thirty, but when it comes to torture, I trust the lady who spent three years married to James Cameron. Influenced herself by Phyllis Diller, Rivers weaponized day-to-day -day domestic front comic riffs into something like social criticism of the rituals of suburban life in New York's Westchester County. I'm from a little town called Larchmont where if you're not married, if you're a girl, and you're over 21, you're better off dead. It's that simple, you know? A new generation would give Rivers her propers, as Sarah Silverman did on the web series In Bed With Joan. Women run comedy. It's all... Tina Fey and Whitney Cummings and Joan Rivers and yeah, all those hacks. That's enough. <laughs> In an old school showbiz world, dominated by men who flaunted their privilege, Rivers fought for opportunities, battling to be paid what she was worth, hosting her own shows without compromising her viewpoint or her sass. I don't know if any of you saw in the paper, we have been banned in Boston, which I think is wonderful. WXNE, so pick a finger, WXNE. <laughs> From stand-up to internet snark, if you seek Joan Rivers' influence, just look around and laugh, even if this comedy matriarch never wanted to be seen as a pioneer or a trailblazer. I don't like when the ladies come up and say, oh, you broke barriers for women. You want to go, I'm still breaking barriers. That's starting with it. And I can still take you, sweetheart, with both hands tied behind my back. Next, how Joan turned family life into the family business, dealing with the tragedy of her husband's suicide. I'm still furious with him. Son of a you checked out? Go yourself. And duking it out with Melissa in a movie about themselves, playing themselves. Are you angry about something? I'm angry about a lot of things, okay? Okay. We'll be right back. continues with more of Joan Rivers living for the laughs. Here's John Quinones. Joan Rivers' personal life was so intertwined with her career that to separate the two was to do the impossible. Mom, you look amazing. Melissa, I saw what's going on under my chin. I don't want to be the one the president has to pardon on Thanksgiving. Much of the time, if she wasn't on stage doing stand-up, she was with her 46-year-old daughter, who was often part of her work. Reality TV, competition shows, red carpets, all woven into Joan's personal life. I think people really, really responded to the relationship between the two of them, and they were very codependent on each other. They did all the things that probably mothers and daughters are not supposed to do, but they, they loved each other so much. She was the ultimate Jewish mother, always looking after her family. Where are you going? Uh, meetings. Like that? Yeah. You know my rule. We are in New York. Before you leave the house, you look to the mirror and you put one more thing on. Mom, I'm going to a meeting, not Studio 54. And that family included her 13-year-old grandson, Cooper. You're so cute. Everyone tells you how cute you are. Do you that? The family business started in 1965 when the struggling comedian met a producer named Edgar Rosenberg. Joan rarely talked about her husband as seriously as she did in this 2010 documentary. I met him and I married him four days later. We worked on projects together, so it was a family business. I bought the book, The Joy of Sex, okay? And I got, did you read that chapter 11? Where you wrap yourself up totally in saran wrap? And I laid, oh yeah, great. And I laid down the dining room table, and my husband came home, he said, leftovers again. Publicly, she was tough and brazen. But when it came to her husband, who managed her private life, she was protective, calling him her Rock of Gibraltar as she told Barbara Walters in 1982. Does Edgar ever mind you making all these jokes about him? I mean, you'd make terrible jokes of Not one joke about Edgar. Stop and think. No, no they're all about, yeah. All about me. Yeah. I have never made a joke about my husband. People think I do, and I'll, he's such a gentleman. Do some of them so we see what. My wedding night, uh, Edgar said, let me help you with the buttons. I said, I'm naked. Okay, <laughs> that's a joke about my body, not about my husband. 
Three years later, she and Edgar gave birth to their daughter, Melissa, and they moved their family to Los Angeles. When I got married, thank goodness, I always knock on wood, my mother thrilled. She wore a chili nap. I mean, just standing there going, hooray for Joan. In spite of her tireless work as a stand-up, Joan tried to be home every night, as Melissa explained in the documentary. And everyone's like, oh, what was it like living with a legend? Which is why I always say to people, it's like you don't realize how in these very extraordinary, abnormal circumstances, what a normal world my parents created. As Melissa grew from young girl to teenager, Joan's career was taking off. It's the late show starring Joan Rivers. In 1986, Joan launched that late night talk show on Fox, making her husband the executive producer. But when the show failed, Edgar took it very personally. Soon after, Joan and Melissa got an unimaginable phone call. Edgar had committed suicide. Mother and daughter were shattered. I'm still furious with him. Son of a They say to me, oh, you'll go to heaven, you'll meet Edgar. I'll kill him. Are you, what, you, you left me with no money, a child that was destroyed, no career, and you checked out? Go f yourself. Melissa was also bitter, but it was aimed at her mother. It was uh, very hard in the beginning because she blamed me. Joan left Malibu to return home to New York to make a new beginning. It was a terrible year, terrible year. And finally I said, I'm going back to New York and I'm going to do something. So I called Neil Simon and said, can I try out for Broadway Bound? And then we got Emmys and uh, it was a great show. Professionally, Joan was starting to pick up the pieces, but personally, she was still trying to rebuild her relationship with her daughter. And they found their own way to deal with the lingering grief in front of the camera. Are you angry about something? I'm angry about a lot of things, okay? In what they called a cathartic experience, they made a movie playing themselves. First off, Mother, I'm very, very angry at you. Since Daddy died, you have not spent one minute at home. As they continued to heal, Joan started including Melissa in her work. And what about the shoes? Hello? Melissa, the straight man. Oh, my God. To Joan's punchlines. Look at the old coot on the shoes. <laughs> I've had enough of this silliness. They even moved into the same house, showcasing their lives in a reality TV series. Hello. 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 A little dribble. It's a little dribble. Why is your dog in my house? You know I always travel with Lola. She, she's the gale to my Oprah. Joan Rivers' high wattage talent was so bright over the decades, her entire family shared the spotlight. I love you, and your life has meant something and more importantly you've meant something to me you've made a difference i hope as you get older you will get your face back. i knew this was going i, I knew it be, i knew I exactly that was gonna be the joke next the business of being joan it wasn't just funny business the Joan you haven't seen before. Thanks. Thank you. Next on Joan Rivers, Living for the Laughs. Twenty twenty continues once again. John Quinones. Joan Rivers was more than a comedian. She was a brand. A one-woman empire worth an estimated $150 million. Like, I'm a racist. Yeah, right. Let me tell you, I don't give a shit if you're white or black or yellow or green as long as you can do my hair. And as oh, yes! At the age of 81, Rivers was still a tireless dynamo. Just last week, covering both the MTV VMA Awards and the Emmys. <laughs> we'll be back in a chippy with more looks that are iffy. In one of Rivers' most insightful moments, shown here in the documentary Joan Rivers, A Piece of Work, we see that drive and determination to stay relevant. I'll show you fear. That's fear. If my book ever looked like this, it would mean that nobody wants me, that everything I ever tried to do in life didn't work. 
nobody cared and I've been totally forgotten. She had many stories of, you know, not getting the check when she was a woman performing by herself at a nightclub and coming back the next day and the check wouldn't be there. So I think over time she had to build a smart business tough skin around her. These were the good years. These were the good years. She was successful as a businesswoman, A, because she was really smart, and B, because she looked for opportunity. She wanted to provide for her family. She wanted to live well. Live well and live large. At home, Joan enjoyed the trappings of success with an opulence usually reserved for Caesar's Palace. Have you ever been to a private dinner in someone's home where they have finger bowls? At Joan's house, you get finger bowls. She lived beautifully. She lived elegantly. This business, you have to work hard. We can do anything in this country, but you've got to work for it. Just this summer, she released her 12th book, Diary of a Mad Diva, a top 10 New York Times bestseller. She was a Broadway regular and recorded several well-received records, one of which was nominated for a Grammy. I'll go anywhere, I'll get on any play to do, to do the business. Any part of this, the writing, the directing, the acting, the stand-up, I just love the business. Joan Rivers was a great brand. Her business brand extended to cosmetics, fashion, and even a jewelry accessories line that generated four and a half million dollars in sales annually. It quickly became a favorite on QVC. Love you, mean it. <laughs> it all came from that instinct that she felt like she was one of our customers. She felt like she knew what that customer wanted and cared about, and she could bring that customer a little joy and a little inspiration. Behind that public persona and brash comedy, a softer side of Rivers, bringing smiles to others in an entirely different way. She was so incredibly generous you know, with her money. There's a moment in the film where she's writing checks. I mean, stacks of checks. It was a small industry. Most people that work with me, if they have children, I send the children to private schools. Joan competed for God's Love on Celebrity Apprentice in 2009. She ended up winning, and with it, more than half a million dollars for her beloved charity. She saved us in some ways during the worst of the recession. The amount of money, number one, that she raised for us really we call her an angel. God's love we deliver. They provide meals and support to those with life-altering illnesses. I think this teaches you what Thanksgiving is really about. I know it sounds corny, 